Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement 2. It's a super mini mail call episode. Let's jump right into it. I have a lot of stuff to try to get through and I need to start chipping away at the big pile which is sitting right next to me, which is all mail call items. Now this is the first item and I might have already shown this on a mail call episode. And if that's the case, um, I do apologize, but I just wanted to show off this awesome thing that my friend Dan gave me. It is just so useful and cool. I use it all the time. So I just wanted to make sure that everyone knows about it. So this thing is called the C2C Caber Q version 3.2. <laughs> what this is a USB-C cable tester. Now this is actually just a passive device. It's got a CR2032 battery on here and then a bunch of LEDs. And that's basically it. What you do is you take a cable and you plug it into both sides of this and it lights up to tell you what kind of cable it is. Now I can tell by the pattern of LEDs we see here that this cable I just plugged in does not have the capability of transmitting the alternate mode. So like HDMI or DisplayPort or Thunderbolt over this cable. Now it's not surprising because it's a relatively thin cable. And unfortunately this won't tell you like how much current capacity a cable has because I think there's often chips inside here which help uh, tell your device you're plugging into how much current you can actually support. Why don't we take a look inside the manual because I think it has a few little things to help you understand what the different modes are. Now it's pretty self-explanatory. There's LEDs and we have an LED on the bottom that tells you if the shield is connected, uh, which incidentally on this cable right here, the shield is not connected. So if we unplug one end and you just touch the shield on here, that means that, well, there's no grounding or shielding on this cable because uh, the outside part here, this metal should be connected. And I have other cables that are, and it lights up this LED right here. For testing the cable, just simply connect it up. And here is a pinout of USB-C and all of the various connections that are possible with it. And there's a section here that talks about all the different modes of operation of these cables. So for USB power delivery, you just need ground VBUS, which is the power itself. It says you need shield, I guess you should have shield, and then CC1 or CC2. I think it's option A and B because the cable's reversible. So either of those works. So again, if we take this cable here, so we know that shield is not working. And when we go to plug this in, we have ground, we have CC2 lit up, and we have VBUS lit up. So that shows that this cable is capable of power delivery. It also has, and I just noticed that not all the lights were on. Uh, there we go, that's weird. So yeah, D minus and D plus, those are required for data transfer as well. And I think that's gonna say that right here. So yeah, USB 2.0, it requires D plus, D minus, the ground and the V bus connection. So if you have CC one or two, and then you have these D minus or D pluses as well, that means it's a USB two cable capable of power delivery. And that's exactly what this wire is. Now it goes without saying that USB-C is a cool thing, but it's also very confusing because look at all the different like modes of operation you have. So a single lane USB three or 3.1 ends up with TX one, RX one, TX one and RX one minus and plus. But to do the dual lane, you need the extra wires here. You need to have these extra transmit lines connected. And when you have a cable that you think is USB 3 or 3.1, you don't really know like if it's the dual lane or the single lane. Notice here that for the USB 3.2 or 3.0 or 3.1 operation, it doesn't even use the D plus and the D minus signals at all. It's only using all this differential signaling here for the PCI Express lanes. Now there's the alternate mode as well, which has exactly the same connections here as the single lane. And this allows the HDMI to transmit over this or display port, stuff like that. And check this out. There's an audio adapter accessory mode. I don't really know this one. CC1, CT2, SBU1, and SBU2 are required along with the USB 2.0 data signals. So I have this cable here. This is a relatively thick and somewhat high quality seaming cable. Let's see what this one actually is. So first off, just touching the shield lights up the LEDs. Now it's funny that the that lights up, but also the ground signals light up along with these CC2 and CC1 signals. I have this little USB 2.0 cable here, which doesn't act that way. Let's plug this one in and just touching the shield here. Oh, okay, it turns on shield and also the ground signals, but those CC lines are not enabled. Let me pop this in, there we go. So this is definitely a USB 2.0 cable. So let's test this one that I think is USB 3. I just don't know if it's 3.1 or, or 4 or 3.2 or what. Okay, so plugging that in, we got a lot of lights coming on. So there's TX1, RX1, minus and plus right there on the top. And we also have RX2 and TX2 plus and minus on there as well. 
along with the uh, USB 2.0 mode, so D plus and minus, and we have SBU1 as well. So that's like that audio accessory mode. So that tells me that this cable is actually a USB, what, 3.2 or slash four. Yeah, so what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna write, I don't know, I'm just gonna write a four on here. <laughs> so, I, so I can tell this apart from other cables. And the last cable I want to test is an Apple USB-C cable. I think I got this with like my MacBook Air. So let's see, let's see what this one is. I wouldn't be surprised if this is USB 3, but not 3.1. Oh, so this one has a shield connection, but the ground is not common on it. All right, well, this is not even a Thunderbolt cable or USB 3.0 cable at all. This is purely a USB 2.0 cable. Now I know. I, I don't know, I always kind of assumed that it would come bundled with a USB 3 cable. Nope. So thanks, Dan, for giving me this USB Type-C cable tester. I have to say, I find this thing extremely useful. And the only thing is, I wish they had printed some of those little charts with what's what on the back here with the silk screen. Kind of wish they had done that. That would have been handy just, just to refresh your memory on what the different LED patterns mean. All right, next up is a package right here that I've already opened. Um, and if you look at the side here, it says EEV blog, because what this is, is a replacement multimeter from Dave Jones over at EEV blog to replace my failing 121GW here. So this is the multimeter I always use on the channel. And if you watch my videos, all of them, recently I've had a couple videos where I showed some issues with this multimeter. Specifically, we think it's the range switch. I sent some videos over to Dave of this thing misbehaving, and it always seems to happen on the continuity mode where occasionally you get like no continuity at all or you get strange readings. And if I just sort of like bang on the multimeter like that, it starts working. Dave said in an email that some of the early units have an issue with the range switch when it has to do with like the thickness of the PCB or something along those lines. I've had this thing for a number of years now, and I have to say, I haven't really run into any issues with it. And it was only recently that it started acting up. And it's funny because Dave said that early on when these were first shipping, the range switch issue sort of appeared on some of the early units. But for whatever reason, this one lasted for, well, quite a long time now until it just started misbehaving. So let's uh, take a look at the new one. I don't think there's really gonna be much to see here. This is just gonna be an identical one. Wow, Dave sent me the entire kit. Thanks very much, Dave, for that. So a new set of probes. And I gotta say, I really love the probes that this multimeter comes with. They are super soft and flexible silicone wires. And compared to, well, um, cheap multimeters, which have like PVC wiring, these are just fantastic. And actually look at this, they are different. They're still very soft and flexible, but we have a different looking uh, probe here. So the early ones here were actually gold coated. And I really like that because they just didn't oxidize and you didn't have issues with that. But it's funny because the gold coating has pretty much scratched off. It just shows how much I use these things, I guess. So I think I'll be pairing up these older probes with the new multimeter here, and these will be my backup ones. So like this multimeter still does seem to work fine in all the other range modes. Problem is honestly, and I've talked about this a little bit with test equipment, when you have a piece of test equipment that gives you inconsistent results, what starts to happen is you start to not trust your test equipment. And let's be honest, when you're working with computers that are flaky and I'm fixing stuff all the time, I really don't have time or energy to deal with test equipment that is malfunctioning. And what happened when I, when I started having issues with continuity mode, I didn't really realize there was a problem. And I would like check for continuity. And one of the weird failure modes is instead of it showing like a dead short and beeping, it would beep, but it would show some value of resistance. So I was like probing around on a motherboard. I'm like, oh, it's not a dead short. And I was probing around. I'm like, nope, not a dead short. I'm like, wait, what's going on? These, are, these should be dead shorts. And then I would take the probes and I touch them together. And then I'd have like, you know, 40 ohms. And I was like, what's happening? So, you know, I'd turn it off and turn it back on. And then it would start to work properly again. I alluded to this problem of having test equipment that doesn't always work properly when I was trying to repair that Tektronix scope. I think there was a ch main channel video recently. Same thing, that scope would often work and then sometimes you would like switch modes or something and then you would get really weird readings because there was something wrong with the attenuator module, some kind of uh, corrosion or oxidation in there. And that right there means that I could never use that thing, not without completely replacing those attenuators because it's gotta work 100%. My oscilloscope and my multimeter, they just need to work all the time 
as they should, as they're designed to work. Now, as far as like what kind of multimeter is best for you to have at home on your bench, things like that, I really can't recommend one multimeter over another. I don't know enough about multimeters. What I like about this one, well, there's a few things I really like about the 121GW and there's some stuff I don't like about it. One of the things I really like about this multimeter is there are a lot of digits on here that show up. So if we're switch this over into resistance mode here and I short these leads together, you can see we have three digits and that's actually really useful for me when I'm checking for shorts, specifically for instance, shorted tantalums on a motherboard. When you have so much digits of precision, you can actually tell the difference between two or three capacitors to figure out which is the one that's actually shorted because the shorted cap is gonna have the lowest value on here and then all the rest are gonna have some additional resistance because there's traces and stuff that it's going through. So one shorted cap might be 0.655 and another one that seems shorted might be 0.658. And that slight difference right there is enough to go, okay, it seems like this is the shorted cap, not this other one. And if you have like 40 caps on the board and you don't know which one is shorted, having this accuracy really does help. Now, some of the features that I don't really like on this are how slow the auto ranging can be, especially on resistance here. So if we touch this together, Notice how long it takes there before we get a reading. It's, it's quite a while. Now this can be mitigated somewhat by just setting the range manually ahead of time. So if I just push range until we get ohms there, now when I touch this together, right away it pops up, right? So if all I'm looking for are dead shorts on boards, then that's what I would do. That, that gives me really quick readings. So that's the one thing about this multimeter is I wish it were a little bit faster. Now the firmware I put on this thing is this 2.04 and it is upgradable. That actually sped up the auto ranging on this one. Now, there might be newer firmwares because this one has been on here for a number of years now and um, we'll see what's on this one in a second. It might actually be faster now. Another thing I like about this particular multimeter is it remembers the last mode you were in. So if we go to the resistance setting here, it's gonna go back to resistance mode. Now, if I have it on continuity mode, like where the beeper is active, like there, then if we turn it off and go back, it's just gonna remember what it was on before. Same goes for the voltage, AC, DC, that kind of thing. It just remembers. The range does get reset, like if you have it on manual ranging, but that's that's totally normal and expected. But seems a lot of cheap multimeters, especially like the ones from China and stuff, they just don't remember the last setting you're on. And what really bugs me is I'm almost always using, for instance, the continuity mode where I want the beeper to actually work. And on a lot of those cheap multimeters, you go to the resistance setting, which is you know usually three or four functions, including the beeper, and you have to like push the mode button or whatever button it is a bunch of times to get to the beeper every single time. That's really frustrating to me. And I have this little multimeter on the bench all the time. And this one is like that. So we go to resistance setting here. It always just starts up in the resistance setting and it never remembers what you were in before. So here we are in resistance mode and I just sort of clipped the probes together. Notice that there are far less digits of precision on this. So it's a lot more difficult Actually, what's happening? Why is this not just a dead short? Does this have a range switch pro Oh, this has a range switch problem as well. I can't believe that. What's going on down here in the basement? Anyways, we only have two digits on here and we had three on this. This is so much better suited to finding those shorted tantalums than this. It still works. Like you might have like 0.41 and 0.43, you know, with another cap. But sometimes if they're really close together on the PCB, you need additional digits and uh, this one can do it. But yeah, you saw what was happening there. The resistance was sort of floating all over the place until I hit it. Oh no, no, really? Is this thing actually failed as well? Wow, I have bad luck. Maybe something going on in the basement here. Anyhow, I just switched this over to a continuity mode with the beeping, so there it is. But if we turn this off and we turn it back on, it will make a beep sound. You're like, oh cool, it's in continuity mode again, but it's not. It just went back to resistance mode. And it's kind of slow as well, the uh, auto ranging on this one. But yeah, you gotta like push this button every single time. And the same goes for the voltage measurement, which I think it defaults to DC. Yeah, it does. But if you're doing a lot of AC measurement, every single time you open this thing or turn it on, it's gonna have to push the button here to switch into AC. Kind of annoying. 
Now this little Anang thing here was super inexpensive. So, I mean, I'm not like angry about it. The fact that it doesn't have those features. I really hardly use it ever. It's more just to have like a second multimeter if I'm measuring multiple voltage rails at the same time. It's obviously really little, very cheap. And of course it's very, very light as well. Let's take the batteries out of this one and we'll pop them into the new one here. Now I use rechargeables in here because I just don't want any kind of battery leakage to ever happen. I like how the tilting bale, by the way, is on this part that's removable. So look how much smaller this is. It's so funny when it's not in its case. I mean, compared to this one, it's still big and it's still heavy. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this obviously is a lot of shock absorption if you do drop it and you know you have clips here for the probes and you can put a belt clip on there. But what's cool about this multimeter, and Dave's been in the industry for a long time, is he designed this thing with the features that he wanted, like a captive screw on here for when you open the battery compartment. Stuff like that just shows attention to detail that stuff like this like cheap multimeter here is just not gonna have because they don't care. Oh, I just noticed there's batteries already in here. <laughs> I didn't even like think to check that. All right, well, uh, firmware wise, what are we on here? We're on 2.05 as well, which I think is the same. Oh no, one newer than this one. All right, cool. Do I notice any other differences? LCD? Looks about the same. Now there's a menu in here, you can adjust the contrast and stuff. And I think I've done that on this. Now I've never actually opened up this multimeter before. I just got it, put batteries in it. Well, I think I've you know replaced batteries and stuff in here and I just use it. This is my primary multimeter that I use most of the time. All right, so four screws are out. I think there's a clip right here. There we go. There it is. So we have some shielding in there and the guts. There's a battery right here, replaceable battery. There's the Bluetooth module. This does have some Bluetooth capability, which I have to say I've never actually used. Now I was gonna say, maybe I should take the PCB out here and see if I can see anything on the under the range switch, but I don't know if I really wanna do that. I'm not an expert at taking these things apart and putting them back together, and I do wanna keep this working, so I am afraid to do something where I might break it. Just in case anyone's curious, there's the board revision version 01 and 1745. I said to Dave, if he wanted me to open this up and take a look at anything inside that I could, and uh, he said, nah, it's not, it's okay. He, uh, he just sent me the new ones. So Dave, the offers does still stand. If you do want me to take this apart further to try to look at the range switch area, I can. But as everyone can see, in case you thought there was like corrosion that had gone inside of here, that is simply not the case. I use this thing all the time and I keep the batteries replaced and that's why I use these rechargeables because they're much less likely to die. And of course I would never leave batteries in something long-term if uh, I was keeping it stored. By the way, the date here is the date I bought these batteries. I'm not even sure Ikea sells batteries anymore. I, I, last few times I've gone, I've looked and they never seem to have batteries anymore. Well, they stopped selling alkalines a while back and they only had these rechargeables, but even now they don't even sell these anymore. So I don't know what's going on with that. Now, one thing I want to mention is I actually have a screen protector on this, and I typically do that. You know, you can buy those screen protectors for like iPads, they're really big plastic ones, and then you just cut out a piece of it, and then you can stick it on your plastic stuff like this. That way, if you ever do get scratches on this, you can just peel it off and put a new one on. Now, it's kind of dirty because I probably spit on it while talking. <laughs> I don't really throw my multimeter into like a work bag or something, but I totally recommend doing this if you do want to try to protect your screen by just installing uh, a screen protector on it. I uh, noticed the new one here has a screen protector on it as well, but this is just the one from the factory. So these are not the same because they kind of bubble up and peel off and whatever. I'll just leave it on for now. It's not really causing an issue, but if you notice this one here does not cover the edges and I did make this one myself. I cut it exactly to shape. And while this one, you can see it's sort of like overlapping here. And that means it's gonna to start to peel off soon. The clarity is usually a bit better on the ones designed for smartphones and tablets as well. All right, so the range switch on this one definitely feels a lot more clicky. It's just, I mean, this one's still clicky as well. It's just even more clicky on this one. Obviously this one's worn a little bit because I've used it a lot and this one, this one's not. Yeah, like it doesn't, it clicks, but it's just not, this one is just snappy. All right, since the firmware is a little different between these two, and I'm noticing the temperature is slightly different, that 24.4 on the old one and 21.4 on the new one. Let's see about auto range speed here on the resistance measurement mode. So if I touch these together, yeah, okay, does that. <laughs> 
And on my old one here, Well, one thing I'm noticing is I think this one's acting up. Did you notice how low the resistance value was? Like typical with the probes is going to be like 0 0.2, 0 0.3, and it was like 0 0.0 whatever. That, that seemed too low. And now it's kind of going all over the place. Let's clip these together. I've gone ahead and I clipped the probes together. That way I'm not touching it. I mean, maybe they just are really low resistance. I don't know. Let's just switch the mode here. Yeah, it just seems a bit weird how it starts low, like 0.03, and then it ends up here. Yeah, I mean, you notice, look at that. I just pushed on this, and it changed dramatically. So, yeah, we know the range switch on this one is, is just fussy. I'd say something is weird going on with this. I guess one way we can easily just tell is let's just swap the probes over to this one. So the new one is on the right, right? This is the old one on the left here. Let's see what this one gives us. Yeah, okay. So these probes seem to be lower resistance than the old ones. That's interesting. But this one kind of just goes right to 0.8 once it auto ranges. No, okay, it's doing the same thing. Okay, so I guess that's just kind of how it works. And you just have to wait for it to settle a moment. So let's switch this over. Wow, it's really um, that positive connection. Well, both the connections are quite stiff. Hopefully they'll break in a little bit. Okay, yeah, I guess it's acting the same. Now, of course, it doesn't really matter if the probes themselves have high resistance because you just relative it out, you know, if you want to uh, zero it out basically like that. And the stability of the multimeter itself is what we're looking at there. So if I push on the range switch here, move it around, I mean, it seems okay. That's what's weird about this one is it works fine for a while and then it starts to really act up, which it definitely doesn't seem to be doing right now. Yeah, it's okay. And moving back to this new one here with the probes, I'm not touching anything here. And we hit relative. That stability looks basically exactly the same. Um, okay, I think it's misbehaving right now. So it's in relative mode still, but why is it showing 36 ohms? So let's get this out of relative mode. Yeah, this one's misbehaving. And watch this, if I just hit it, There we go. <laughs> See, that fixed it. One hit didn't do it. I had to kind of hit it a few times. Yeah, how funny. It's just random when it starts misbehaving, and that's the problem, is it's just not consistent. Therefore, it's just not trustworthy. Uh, even though this one's a little bit dodgy, it seems to be just ever so slightly a little bit more stable, but, you know, whatever. That's honestly neither here nor there. Look at this. Just I just bumped it, and look at the resistance value, and it's not moving anymore. And let's see if it will always go back to that same value. I've seen that before. Yeah, look, it's stuck. When it's measuring anything, it's gonna measure that. Like I could just touch these together. There's no way that it wouldn't be changing right now. Yeah, this is one of the, this is one of its behaviors that it also does. It just sort of gets stuck. Now we're in relative mode. If we take off relative mode here, hopefully it won't upset it. Oh no, just pushing on the button fixed it. Yeah, now it's going to be working correctly. But if I was out of relative mode, it would have also been stuck at some value like 0 0.008 and never changing at all. Just always sitting there at that exact same value. Okay, I think it's in that mode right now. It says negative 0 0.110 and we're out of relative mode. And I think it's going to show that reading all the time. Okay, well now it's freaking out in auto ranging mode. But if we touch these together, yeah, it's just gonna go always right back. <laughs> okay, well anyways, look, I already knew this thing wasn't working and that's exactly why Dave sent me a new one, which is gonna work. So I'm just gonna stick my probes that I like over into the new one. And what I think I'm gonna do on this one is I'm gonna use this red marker here to just draw over the entire resistance area here. That way it just reminds me that this run in here is the one I should never use on this particular setting. And I should probably just maybe put a label on here as well, just to say, don't trust this one, just use it as a backup. And that is it. Meanwhile, this one here is gonna be my new go-to one. So 
I just wrap it up like this. I like to keep the probes over on the side here. That way uh, it doesn't put any stress on the connectors. And I just sort of leave it like this. This is how I have it at arm's length up on the top of my bench all the time. And the funny thing is now that this one is misbehaving now on resistance, I don't even know if I'm gonna keep this one. I might need to send this thing off to recycling because I just, no, that's okay now. It's almost like the oxidation got cleared by just moving the switch around. It's still acting up ever so slightly, like just moving the switch around. Sometimes it reads all zeros, which we know is not possible. Ah. I don't know, for now, I guess I'll just throw this in the drawer. Let me just make sure the batteries in here are, are okay for long-term storage. I don't want it to leak or something. You know, it's funny thinking about this. Maybe I just need to spray some deoxid in here. <laughs> like I could do it on this one too. I don't know. I'm not sure that's the right thing to do though, because it's like a, it's a calibrated device and putting something like deoxid in there might throw it all off. So if anyone's like an expert at multimeters or whatever, is that a bad idea to put some kind of contact cleaner or a lubricant like deoxid onto the contacts? Oh, I just uh, took the four screws out when the reality is the battery is under this little <laughs> single screw here. Okay, uh, this has regular energizers in it. Have they leaked? Let's see, I should just get them out anyways. Oh, they're AAAs, okay, that's fine. I got some rechargeables of those as well. Yeah, I don't really, they're the industrial ones. Is that somehow better? I don't know. It's not like it's leaked or anything, but since I'm gonna throw this into a drawer, I'm gonna put rechargeables in there. I just feel a little bit better about them long-term. Alkaline seem to leak so quickly for me. I just have the worst luck. This also has a screen protector on it, by the way. I didn't do as good a job aligning it. See, it's slightly misaligned, but this is the phone one as well. The phone ones are better than the built-in ones like that's on here, because it doesn't bubble up. Now, speaking of range switches, I have this, and this has a very flaky range switch on it. Look, it does that kind of stuff. See, <laughs> it's really bad. Just, just touching it makes the whole thing reboot. So I don't know if I just, I, well, I think sometimes I do this and it, it gets a bit better. And it's not the batteries because hitting it over here, it's fine. But if I just hit the range switch, that's when it sometimes starts to reboot and just do strange things. So I'm having a lot of issues with range <laughs> switches on all my, all my devices. Yeah, look at that just not reliable. It's very frustrating. So yeah, deoxid. Is that going to fix this? Please let me know. Will deoxid ruin these things? Or should I just spray some in there to at least make these things work a little bit better? So Dave, I really do appreciate you standing behind your products. For total transparency, the original one I did buy with my own money. This was not something that Dave just sent in for free, uh, but Dave obviously sent me this replacement for free um, once he found out that the original one was misbehaving. So yeah, I really appreciate that. And uh, like I said, this one here with my old probes though is gonna be my go-to uh, multimeter from now on. So it just sits right up here above the bench here. So it's at arm's length at all times when I need to work on stuff. Yeah, I love it. Now, if only I could fix this piece of junk, that would be great because this is just unacceptable. Oh, and just one little side note for this one, just in case you thought maybe there was some battery corrosion that was causing the flakiness. Now, look, notice I have uh, rechargeables in here as well. These are the same type I'm gonna put inside this one, which are good because for long-term storage where you, know, you don't use it very often, I just wanna avoid that crusty, crusty, crappy, leaky alkaline garbage that you get. All right, I think people were screaming at their screen. I just noticed here, I was cleaning up after finishing the segment and there's another set of probes that came with the 121 GW. And these seem to be the same as the ones that I was using. Um, it just has these screw on banana clip adapters and they're gold and they're nice. <laughs> so I don't know, I'm surprised that it came with two sets. I mean, I'm not gonna complain, but these appear to be very similar. Let me grab the other one. Uh, yeah. Oh, they're the, they're the identical ones, I think. Yes, they are. Okay, cool. So yeah, correction. It does come with the same nice probes that I really like. And um, I don't really remember getting a set like this on the first time around, but maybe I did. And I just, I don't remember. I think I, I decided I really like these probes. It's freaking awesome. I love these probes. I love these probes. Makes using cheap multimeters like this feel actually nice because these aren't those horrible probes actually come with these, which are literally so garbage, you almost want to throw them in the trash. All right, so I just grabbed another package off the pile right here. And this one here comes from a viewer in Serbia. 
I don't see a name on the outside of the package, but it's got some awesome Serbian stamps here. Let's take a look. Just want to make sure I cover up any personal information that might be visible on here. I used Google Lens to take a picture of these. And uh, yeah, it took me to a website that was from Serbia that talked about these stamps, which I think were issued in 2023. I think it was like 70 years of a newspaper or something like that. That uh, is what these stamps are about. But I noticed right in here it says Serbia as well. So I could have seen that and, uh, <laughs> and noticed that. But how awesome. I'm not sure I've gotten any packages from Serbia before. And there's just a little one here. So we'll have to take a look at what this is. All right, so inside there was this little wrapped up package here with a couple parts or whatnot. And what is this exactly? Oh, 128 kilobyte memory upgrade for the ZX48. All right, I remember this email here, 128 kilobyte memory upgrade for the ZX Spectrum. Pretty sure that's exactly what this is. So we have some uh, flash memory right here and um, well, I can't really tell what that is. Ah, oh, okay, that's a gal. And then right there, we have an HCT273. And flipping this around here, um, yep, there it is, a little thing here just to help you uh, not put this in backwards because this is a keyed connector on the back of the machine. Now, from my understanding, the only difference between the ZX Spectrum, the later versions with 128 kilobyte, were the extra RAM, which is uh, replicated with this, and also an additional sound chip. So to run the software design for those later machines on the early machines, you need this card along with another card that would sandwich in between this and the computer that added that sound chip as well. Now I went ahead and I grabbed my ZX Spectrum. Here it is, my 48K model. Now this was one I picked up in the UK a while ago and uh, while well, the case was in good shape, it needed some repairs, but this metal plate that was on here was in really poor shape. And of course the membrane itself was bad as well. But the awesome folks over at ZX Renew sent in the new keyboard membrane and this metal plate so I could rejuve or make this thing look as good as new again. And indeed, it does. I guess the only thing is there's a little bit of rust on the screws here. <laughs> but that's, that's, uh, that's really it. Now there's that expansion connector there and you can see that uh, the key there will line up. And we should be able to plug this in. Yep, just like that. Now the issue I have with this particular unit is that it is unreliable when it comes to loading off of tape. It's an issue two or three, whichever it is, it's a version of this that is just notoriously bad at loading software. And I've tried all sorts of things like external amplifiers and things like that hooked up to a phone and I could never reliably get software to work on this. It would work sometimes, just not reliably. So I don't really use this thing very much because of that. Now I do have other Spectrums like this one here, which I think is a Spectrum Plus. Yes, it is, there it is. I think this is 128K. I have multiple of these. These were donated to the channel by Stuart a while back and you notice it has the same expansion connector there. Problem with these is they all have bad keyboard membranes. I have bought new membranes, so I have those so I can get these things working. I just haven't had a chance to do that yet. Now the keyboard on here, while it, <laughs> I'm just, I'm laughing because the keyboard has a much like more conventional layout than this one, obviously, with like the space key over here and it has a normal space bar and we have arrows as well. And I don't know how you even get to those on there. Problem is this still feels extremely horrible to type on. Probably better than this, but marginally, if, if anything at all. I'm really not super familiar with all the differences between like the plus here and the regular original one there. But uh, this thing, does it have extra like joystick ports or anything on it? No, it doesn't. I think the motherboard in this is literally the same one that's in this one. So I'm pretty sure there's actually no difference. I don't think the Spectrum Plus is larger in RAM. It doesn't have that extra sound card in it or sound chip. I think there's really no difference. In fact, uh, yeah, I think I could probably take the motherboard out of this and put it in here with this working keyboard and actually make this thing load software better because almost certainly this thing is better at loading software. Now, speaking of spectrums, I have another spectrum here. This is one I bought from a seller in, I think, China. And you notice when I open this, this thing looks like a regular original ZX Spectrum. So like, just like my OG unit here, it does have this like screen attached to it right now, but this is not a regular OG Spectrum. 
This is actually a modern interpretation, I guess, of one. So it still has the expansion connector, but it has an HDMI port as an example. It has an RGB video output, which I think this is connected to. Unplug this here. Yes, there's a multi-pin connection there. I think there's a cable that goes from this to SCART. That's for the cassette interface. And then it has joystick ports over on this side. I think it's got a card slot right there. The attached screen is, is screwed into the case here, so you can remove this and then, you know, it just looks like an original Spectrum. Uh, it says ZX Spectrum personal computer. I don't, I actually haven't really had a chance to try this. We've got a couple buttons on the side here. I bought this Spectrum because it was pretty cheap, first of all, and then it would do away with all that software loading issues I had, not to mention the fact that it's RGB and not a kind of crappy composite video signal. Um, these were all just awesome extra features. Also, the interface here for the joysticks was really nice because you did away with having to plug in those like Kempton or whatever interfaces that plug into the back here that would allow you to uh, use a regular joystick. So let me just remove the screen here. That's why I was just taking those screws out. While this thing is apart, there's one more screw I need to take out here. And yep, that screw is shorter. So I don't think these screws are gonna work in here without the uh, attached screen. What I wanna do is just see what's going on in here. Okay, so it uses the same looking keyboard. <laughs> That's kind of cool. But there's a couple other things in here. Notice it's got battery holders. So yes, you can actually use this thing without batteries. And there it is, it's the ZX Omni 128HQ. So from my recollection, I think this thing is not emulating the regular machine. I think this is the Z80 CPU right here. It's just a surface mount package. So it's not emulation. It is a real ZX Spectrum. It just has the extra hardware, like the extra sound chip, 128K of RAM. And then I think it's got like an FPGA or something like right here that handles the HDMI plus the SD card interface. But you can see that like, I think this is a standard keyboard interface that would work on this one, for instance. Flipping this over, we have the card slot there. We have a bunch of dip switches, which I guess configure like the mode of operation. There's a Wi-Fi module right there. That's kind of cool. And a speaker. I mean, yeah, this is neat. I really like how this machine looks totally stock, but yet has all those add-on features that you would normally have to buy interfaces for if you were gonna try to like pimp out an original one like this. So that's why I got this. I don't remember how much I paid for it, but I remember it being relatively inexpensive, but I did some math in my head. And if I took this one and I wanted to pimp this out with extra RAM, the sound chip and the joystick interface and the SD card interface, you have a bunch of stuff hanging off the back. And it would also cost, I think it was gonna cost more than this thing cost. So I was like, oh, I'll just buy this because I get RGB and I get HDMI and that just simplifies everything. And then there was this little screen here that if you combine this with the batteries on the inside, then you got like a little ZX Spectrum laptop, which frankly is uh, kind of cool. Looking at the stuff I got with this, looks like I got a power supply, a SCART cable, a remote that's obviously for the LCD. These seem to be, I don't know, power cables with some screwdrivers and another set of screws. These seem to be the screws that would be necessary for the case. They're the, uh, the shorter screws. You need these longer screws if you're gonna mount the, the screen on there. So yeah, I'm gonna put this thing back together just like this. And the other thing that particular seller has, which I don't remember off the top of my head, is these reproduction joysticks here, Competition Pros, and they feel really nice. They're very solid feeling. What's it say on the bottom here? Oh, there we go. That's right. This reminds me right here, Retro Radionics. That's the seller, retroradionics.co.uk. I think this is all somehow associated with Peter over at ZX Renew, although I'm not 100% sure of the connection of all of that. I first heard about this through a YouTuber, Mr. Lurch, Mr. Lurch's Things. He had one of these featured on his channel and I'm like, oh, gotta go buy one. So I did. And yeah, I've had it sitting around in a box unused for all this time. But yeah, you got got reproduction joysticks and this, that, and the other thing. So if you wanna get back in the ZX Spectrum and you wanna avoid having to, well, deal with like an RF or composite mod and all that stuff, then, then this is a great option because you got SCART, you got HDMI, SD card. It's all just there and much easier to use than these original ones. Not to mention all the original ones have bad keyboards. <laughs> but looking at the construction quality, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, the plate here that I have for my real unit is the same as the one on here. I mean, just look at how similar these look. Pretty amazing. Even this is raised as it is on the original. I'd say it's a little like brighter white color, 
than on this reproduction. And I guess you have these like buttons that stick through and obviously you don't have that on the original. But I do totally dig this thing and um, I think it's a really cool project to have such an awesome replica. So I'm just gonna put this back together using the short screws for a future time when I actually do some work on the ZX Spectrum machines. Yes, I wanna fix up the plus units I have with those new keyboard membranes I bought. I might have a toast rack one, which I think is the one that actually has the sound chip in it. I can't quite remember, to be honest. <laughs> I need to do a special specy episode. I just wanna check my email about who sent me this RAM expansion and it came from Ivan. So hi Ivan and hi to all my Serbian viewers. Thanks very much for saying this in. I'm gonna put this back in its anti-static bag. And then I don't actually know how to test this. Like this thing works. Well, <laughs> it used to work. So my viewers who are watching, who know how ZX Spectrum stuff works, is there a way I can test this? Like maybe a little type in program that plugged into this original Spectrum that I can actually make this work. The other alternative is, I don't know where it went, but the Spectrum Plus here, which I'm pretty sure is just a 48K Spectrum, since this thing probably has a working tape port. Although to be honest, I don't even know if these work. Maybe with a working tape port, I can load some software off of like a sound card that could test the that test this thing fully. Or maybe there's a replacement ROM I can put in this thing with like a full diagnostic that would also test the RAM and see if it's working. There it is plugged into the Spectrum Plus and it totally fits. So yes, please uh, let me know what to do here. I'm sure lots of folks watching are gonna know exactly how to do this stuff and um, I'm looking for advice. After recording the footage for this mail call episode, Ivan sent me some additional info for this RAM expansion. So to use this, you do have to make a modification to your 48K Spectrum. It seems that the 128K module that plugs in the back uses the same bank switching methodology that the later Spectrums use. And that means it's replacing the upper 32K of RAM on the Spectrum with four banks. So there's a little bit of a modification that needs to be done. So this is the info that Ivan sent me. Ivan also went ahead and sent me some info on diagnostic ROMs for the machine. And then finally, Ivan took some kind of tape-based diagnostic and modified it so it would actually test all 128K of RAM. Seems that this normal diagnostic goes and looks for the 48K ROM that's in the machine by stock and will only test 48K RAM if that's the case. It doesn't seem to support this external expansion. And I guess that's kind of one of my questions is, if things just look for the 48K ROM and we'll always just assume it's there, does anything actually work with this 128K of RAM that wouldn't also expect, for instance, the sound chip to be present on the machine? And here's a picture of a RAM expansion module in use with the sound card expansion as well, or the sound chip expansion. Here's Ivan's GitHub repo for the 16K to 128K upgrade. So if you wanna make your own, the Gerbers are available right here. Ivan mentioned that he's working on a combo AY interface and RAM expansion all in one. So if that's something that you wanna help Ivan work on, definitely hit him up. I'll uh, put a link to his repo and all these other links in the description below. <laughs> Thanks very much Ivan for saying this in. I really appreciate it. And that's, I'm slowly building out my Spectrum collection here. Package here, this one comes from Mikhail in Denmark. I had all my Danish viewers. Let's see what we have in here. It's just a small little package here. Aha, it says SID chip times two. So I recall the conversation now with Mikhail, there were a couple extra SID chips that he had and wanted to send my way. And Mikhail included this little letter right here. As per our email conversation, two SID chips. I've tried to package them as safe as possible. I hope they arrive in one piece. And I also hope that one day they'll find their way into a resurrected 64 and that I and many other subscribers can enjoy to watch you restore them to their former glory. Once again, thank you very much for your YouTube channels. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Let's just take a look at this. My recollection of the email was that one of these was uh, SID for the older machines, the 6581, and the other one was for the newer machines. Both of which I have motherboards that do need some repairs and have some bad chips. In fact, it's kind of funny. I work on videos for the second channel, sort of separate from the main channel. And there are some C64s that you may see in the background from time to time that I am working on. So I'm kind of trying to clear my backlog of busted 64s. All right, just like the email said, a 6581R4AR. I don't really know what AR stands for, but I've seen people say it stands for advanced resonance. And it seems like these ones seem to be A, a bit more reliable, and also sound a little bit different than the older ones and potentially a little bit better. 
and then an 8580R5. This is for the shortboard variant. You, these are not interchangeable, these two chips. You can't put this one onto the motherboard that wants that. It will actually destroy the chip. That's because these older SIDs work on 12 volts and the newer ones only use, I think, nine volts or possibly five volts. Uh, either the VIC-2 uses nine volts and the SID-5 or vice versa, I can never remember. On the older machines, both the SID and the VIC-2 use 12 volts. I recall from the email that these were untested. So let's just make sure that they're not all corroded on the legs. No, that one looks totally good. And this one looks great as well. Sometimes these rubber foam pads can cause a little bit of corrosion on the legs, but looks like we lucked out with both of these chips. This one though, the foam is degrading. Look, when I squish it, it kind of stays squished here. So I'm gonna make sure I throw this piece away so that the legs of these chips are safe. Okay, so let's test these out because I recall Mikhail saying that these were untested. We're going to use the Aldi 64 here for testing because this actually has a short board in it. And um, yeah, it's unfortunate this machine actually, well, has a little bit of yellowing because I think it normally is a bit more of a gray color as opposed to this sort of off beige color. And uh, looks like whoever did the retro writing on this at one point, which I think was a third party company. I'm not 100% sure. And you know, now I think about it, this is not an Aldi 64. I always confuse them. I think this is just the 64G, which does have a short board. You can see the motherboard ends right there. But I'm always mixing up the Aldi and the 64G. So if anyone can remind me of what the difference is, uh, let me know. I, I don't quite remember. I think the Aldi one was actually made in the US for sale in Germany at Aldi stores. But you can notice this one's actually made in Germany. So different somehow. Pop the cover off here. And indeed, yeah, it's a little bit less yellowed in here. That would be the original color of the case versus what we see here. And it's really too bad that whoever retrobrighted this um, got splotches all over it because it's it's a little unsightly. Oh, that's right. This thing has a, a modified ROM on here as well. What also is interesting about this machine, which I'm pretty sure works, is what happened right there. What's causing that? All right, since I always mix things up, I'm gonna draw a couple red circles on these chips just so I don't mix it up with the, the SID that's in this machine. Out comes the original and working SID. Let's just straighten the legs up a little bit on the one that Mikhail sent in. And in the motherboard it goes, there we go. In with the Kung Fu Flash for testing. And we're looking at the retro tank. Power this on. Well, we're getting music. Ah, there we go. We got video as well. So it's good the computer is actually working. And this sounds perfect. Now, it's going to be a bit slower, of course. We know this. So as I was saying, it's a bit slower the music because this 64G is a PAL computer. And that means of course that the music is gonna play slower and a little bit different frequency. But most of these tracks, including this one here, which is the Donkey Kong Country song, was composed on a PAL machine. So we're actually hearing it, well, we were hearing it at the correct speed. Now I fully expected this SID for the shortboard to work. They're extremely reliable, well, compared to 6581s. In fact, this entire motherboard design is also extremely reliable. So as I've kind of gone on a kick of what you should buy if you're looking to get into something, you should probably look for a Commodore 64 that has the shortboard or the smaller motherboard in it. It's just gonna be more reliable. Not like they're totally trouble-free, it just has a lot less of the typical failures like bad ROM chips and bad PLA chips and bad SID chips that afflict the, the longboard versions that are in all the earlier bread bins. I'm just gonna do a little bit more testing on the SID player here. Now, one thing that you have to keep in mind is you actually need to play SIDs, well, you don't need to, but you should play SIDs that are designed for the particular SID model. And I have a directory here for 8580 and also 6581 because specifically you wanna make sure that you stick to the correct model. So actually that Donkey Kong SID, the one we were just listening to, was actually composed for this SID. And you can tell because when you play this here, I have the music turned down. It says 8580 right there and system is PAL. So that information is encoded in the SID file itself. Now I love the music from the demo Lunatico. I don't know how to pronounce that properly, but it's all these songs right here. And it's, it's really, really good. Especially this one, which is like the intro song.
that sounded perfect. That sounded absolutely perfect. And I'm really not surprised in any way. In fact, uh, this city is gonna get a tick mark right now just to indicate that it fully, fully functions. Now you can play SIDS that were designed for the 8580 on the 6581 and it will work. It's just they often don't quite sound right. And depending on the little tricks that are used by the composer, you can have instruments that just sound completely weird and, and distorted, for instance, if you're using the inappropriate SID chip. Usually stuff composed for the 6581 seems to be more often forward compatible with this newer SID, although it sounds can sound quite different. It's often the other way around when you go backwards though, where you get more distortion or more sound issues. In fact, let's try to play that same exact SID tune there on the other SID chip, the 6581 that was sent in by Mikhail. For testing the 6581, we're gonna use my Ziff 64 here. Of course, uh, if you watch my channel, you will have seen this machine a billion times. This poor computer has been through the ringer. <laughs> it's got all sorts of mods done to it and whatnot, but it is a long board, so it's perfect for testing the uh, SIDS here. So this here is the one that Mikhail sent in. So it's nice and easy to put in because I have a ZIF socket. And this has a replacement VIC-2 chip. This is the Kawari 2. And what I love about the Kawari 2, of course, is I can switch between PAL and NTSC. And the reason why I wanna do that is because that Lunatico song we were just playing on the other one really doesn't sound right if you're playing it on NTSC. So we're gonna switch this thing into PAL mode just so we have an apples to apples comparison and we can really hear that difference. You know, before I power this on, it's pretty funny to think about what this machine has been through. Originally, this was a computer that I was, I don't even know where it came from, to be honest. I've had this 64 for such a long time. It wasn't my very first one, but it was a very early one. And you'll notice here that it has like three RAM chips that are in sockets because I think that was the primary problem with this thing when I got it is it had bad RAM. That was the only fault though. But since that point, of course, I've done all sorts of mods with the big one being this zero insertion force socket, at least on these main ICs. There isn't really enough room on the motherboard to install them into these positions here. So I just have sockets installed. I kind of recall this motherboard was not socketed at all. So I had to socket all of the ICs that have ZIF sockets, but also these ones as well, because I wanted a good test bed that was uh, designed for testing stuff. Now you notice the RF modulator here is replaced. This actually has two different modules. I think the green PCB had a little board here with electronics on it originally, but I didn't really like that one. So I actually removed it and installed this one, which I think is an open source one. It just says C64 RF modular replacement Rev B. Who knows? I think it can work in different types of systems, hence the jumpers and whatnot. If you're gonna replace the RF modulator at this point, I recommend you just use the one from the retro channel. Mark over the retro channel has a new version that he just came out with. There are some good videos on his channel about it and you get a massive improvement in video quality over the original RF modulator, which I think was one of the reasons why I did this mod just to kind of test these out. It was early on in my C64 days when I installed this in the board. And I do kind of like it because it replaces the RCA jack here, which is composite video out. And this is an audio output as well. And you can hook up a second SID if you want to have stereo audio there. Although uh, to be honest, I've never used a second SID. Uh, it does retain full functionality here of the video connector. And that's why I'm connected there right now. And then the Quarry here, this is the simplified or the mini version that doesn't actually have HDMI or digital output or RGB output for that matter. It just simply replaces the VIC-2 chip in the motherboard and it just creates all the same analog signals that go either through the RF modulator. Well, I guess it goes through the RF modulator and then outputs through these jacks here. It just gives you the extra capability of changing the color palette, some extra modes like 80 columns mode, stuff like that. Not to mention you can do PAL and NTSC on the fly switching which is super great because you don't need to worry about the crystal oscillator. This is an NTSC crystal oscillator, but this can still run the computer in PAL because it has its own local oscillator and doesn't actually use this timing circuit at all. In addition, you might notice a few other weird things on here. So this is actually a PLA replacement that uses a Russian 82S100 uh, clone chip, I guess you might call it. So it's an equivalent chip. I actually have a package of these I bought, uh, blank ones that is, and using the appropriate programmer, you can just make replacement PLAs and it's 100% drop-in replacement with the original ones. And they're very reliable, these chips, and that's what this one is right here. This one was programmed by my friend Frank over in Italy and he used a Data IO 2900. And after he told me about that programmer, I ended up getting one for myself and I can make these as well. But one of the problems with these is they're very difficult to program, except with very expensive old programmers that hasn't been around a long time. 
So that's why I don't really talk about these or show them much on the channel. And that's just because they're just not useful to most people. You're better off using the GAL PLA ones, the ones from Daniel Manteoni, because you can make those up yourself and program them on any kind of like cheap USB programmer you can still buy today. Now with the ROMs over here, you'll notice that I have Jaffe DOS on here. So that's a modified kernel ROM and it's in a standard EEPROM. And you might be wondering like, how is that possible? Well, same for the basic here. This is an EEPROM as well. These particular chips here are also capable to be programmed on my Data IO 2900 and then just dropped into these machines. So it's a WSI, I think it's like a 7C49C. It's kind of a weird part number and you actually have a couple data lines that are swapped around on this versus like the normal chips that are in here. So I have a little Windows program to do that swapping job and then I can just make up basic ROMs and um, kernel ROMs for 64s and just drop them in. I don't need any kind of adapters or anything like that. And these chips are pretty inexpensive and readily available. Again, the problem is they're not really easy to program. You can't just use a USB programmer, even though there's no reason why you wouldn't be able to. It's just, I think these are a little unusual and it's just the algorithms aren't programmed into them. So if someone figures out how to program these on a regular like T48, then that would be really useful for everyone because then you could just make up replacement ROM super easily. I did have a replacement ROM in here for a while. I can't remember which one it was, but I, I was using the VIC-20 font on my 64. I think you could just use a normal 2732 in place of this, or maybe a 2532. And I think the rest of this thing is pretty much intact, but considering how much trauma this thing has been through, I've like put so many chips in here, so many bad chips have been in this board over the years, and it's never broken again. I mean, the only thing that ever broke were the RAM chips originally when I first got the machine, and everything else in this thing has just been through the ringer. The reason why we're missing like the PLA and ROMs wasn't because those went bad, it's because I stole them out of this thing to like put into other machines to repair them. And these were just the replacements that I dropped in after the fact. The one fault that still exists with this machine has nothing to do with the computer. It's this zero insertion force socket here, this 40 pin one, it's flaky. And sometimes it, you start to get like random characters typed on the screen and just like opening this and moving this chip around a little bit like that and closing it seems to fix that. And even swapping these around or whatever chip is in here, it doesn't matter, that problem manifests itself. And yeah, there's just a little bit, of, these are cheap like imitation sockets, they're not the real thing. And I think that's the problem. So one day I'll just need to replace that and that, that should solve that problem. Anyhow, okay, that was a little bit of overview there. So we have the new SID in here, Kung Fu Flash is in there. And what I need to do is uh, boot this up and switch over to PAL mode, because I'm sure this is in NTSC mode. And it goes without saying, of course, that this is a Commodore VIC-20 case. And I did have to modify it a little bit to get the cartridge slot in there. So I had to Dremel the bottom edge out there just so the cartridge would fit in. That's the only modification you have to do to use a VIC-20 case with a long board, at least a North American one. And then I just swapped the labels over so it has the correct 64 labels. And then this keyboard that I have here is a 64 keyboard. And I guess it's called the... Uh, the Euro keyboard or something and has a different font on it. And it absolutely feels really nice to type on. This is like my favorite of the vintage 64 VIC-20 keyboards. I don't know if this came from a VIC-20 or a 64 to be honest, but whatever it did come from, I kind of love the way the font looks and I really love the way the typing feel is. Not to mention, look at how good this thing is in like absolute mint condition. So this is my hybrid machine. That's just a mishmash of parts. And I just kind of love it. All right, so to switch the Kawari into PAL mode, because it's currently running in NTSC mode, we just go to the utilities here and we run the config utility. And, and you'll notice here, it's a 6567R8, which is the NTSC version of the VIC-2 chip. We just hit the space bar there to emulate either a 6569R3. We can do a 6567R56A, that's an NTSC one as well. And 6569R1 is the early version of the PAL VIC-2 chip. So I like to use the uh, R3 version and we just hit save. And when I power cycle the computer, there it is. Now it's running in PAL mode and it has a really nice, good quality image output. Although I'm in running in composite video mode right now, that's all I have hooked up here. So it would definitely be sharper if we were hooked up through S-Video. So here we are back in the SID player again and we have the 6581 in here and let's try playing this song here. Let's see how this sounds. There is no sound. Did I do something here? I'm not hearing anything. I had a sinking feeling that I did something wrong, like put this in the wrong way, which might've killed it. Let's just check to see if any pins are bent. I mean, no, nope. this one's a little out of position there, but that doesn't matter for like the ZIF socket. So let's just try again here. Okay, maybe now it's working because originally 
when I turned this on, I didn't hear any sound out of the speakers at all. And now I hear kind of a buzzing. And that, that unfortunately is par for the course when it comes to SIDs, they create a little bit of noise when they're operating. Okay, so here we go, let's try that again. Okay, there we go. Well, that was definitely working. And I think this it is definitely working perfectly. That sounds a little bit weird. What I'll do is I'll insert the previous one we just listened to on the other SID, just so you can kind of hear the A to B comparison. <laughs> And there we go. We have two good working SID chips. Thank you very much, Mikhail, for finding these in your stash and sending them over to the basement. And these will absolutely be good chips for fixing future machines because I still have, I think there's still a good number of broken 64s over here that I've been working on. They're sort of on the floor right now. Plus I have some more short boards that are bad as well that a viewer sent in ages ago. I fixed a bunch of those already on videos, but there are definitely more of those. And I think none of those have working SIDs. They're, those SIDs were all pulled off those boards originally. So yeah, it's awesome to have a couple extra spares. Thank you very much for that. So I think that's going to be it for this mail call episode. I really appreciate everyone who sent stuff in for this episode. And then also all the people who sent stuff in for previous episodes and this giant box full of packages down here that everyone has sent in. I mean, there's got to be I don't know, there's probably at least 30 things in here. I mean, a lot of them are little, but just because something is small doesn't mean that it's like quick and easy to make because it could be a really awesome product or thing that takes me a while to make a video about. And then I actually have some bigger boxes over there that I, I need to get to as well. So thanks to everyone who sent stuff in. Thanks to my patrons. Their names are scrolling up the side of the screen. They make it possible that I do this full time. So I really, really appreciate them and all the support I get. If you want to become a patron, there's a link in the description below on all these videos, of course, and you get early access to videos and then uh, higher tiers get behind the scenes stuff, things like that. And uh, subscribe if you haven't already and thumbs up, uh, you know, the usual YouTube stuff. And um, that's going to be that. So stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Bye.